everyone. My name is Heidi Regal. I'm the Associate Vice President of Alumni and Admissions here at McDaniel College. I'm the class of 97, and yes, I recruit Green Terrors for Life. Tonight, I'm joined by two very dear friends who are going to walk us through how to mix up our signature homecoming cocktail and mocktail. So we are joined tonight by Kevin Lindell, class of 97, who owns Broad Street Beverage Consulting, and he has the fun job of creating signature cocktails for the hospitality industry. And Chad Albertson, class of 96, is the trade marketing manager for Sagamore Spirit. He's going to talk a little bit about how they had to pivot during the pandemic. And if his name sounds familiar, it's because you probably just read about him in our Hill magazine. The latest issue is available online. But let's get started. Hey, Chad, why don't you tell us about the heart of the cocktail? Thanks, Heidi. I'm really excited to talk to you a little bit about the base spirit that Kevin's going to be using to create this amazing cocktail. So he's using Sagamore Spirit Signature 83 Proof Rye Whiskey. Now, this rye whiskey is a traditional Maryland style rye. So when I say tradition, you might be thinking, wait, Maryland has a tradition of making rye whiskey? Well, actually, we do. So pre-prohibition, we had about 44 distilleries in the state all making rye whiskey, and about 22 of those were in downtown Baltimore. And they made a very unique, very specific rye whiskey that what is now known to be a Maryland style rye. What that basically means, it's a little bit sweeter than a lot of your other rye whiskeys. So quick whiskey 101. Bourbon that I'm sure most of you know is made with at least 51% corn that was made down in Kentucky. Rye whiskey is made with at least 51% rye. Rye tends to add a little bit of spiciness to that whiskey. Now, what we do is we add a little bit of corn to that, which melds the spiciness out of it, so it makes it very appealing. So we like to say we're the bourbon drinker's rye. So you get some of that sweetness of, uh, from that corn, but then you get that nice balance with that spiciness from that rye whiskey. So like I said, back in the day, we were making a ton of rye whiskey. Um, you know, and it's interesting that um, Heidi mentioned um, distillery switching over to making hand sanitizer. So this actually comes from a long history of the distilling community switching over their production to help the community. Uh, specifically, World War I and II, most of the distilleries in the U.S. switched over to making ethanol for the war effort. So we're super proud to be able to do that now in these COVID days to where we switched over to making uh, hand sanitizer for the community. Um, I will be, I am happy to say that we are back to making whiskey uh, full time in our uh, beautiful waterfront distillery in downtown Baltimore. Um, so this is what this, uh, this amazing Sagamore Spirit rye whiskey is going to go into this amazing cocktail. So a little bit of history about Sagamore Spirit. We got our start probably about four and a half years ago. Uh, and our really main goal was to inspire a global passion for, for Maryland rye whiskey. Um, and Maryland rye, like I said, has been around a long time. Rye whiskey specifically has really um, come to be known as the first truly American whiskey. It was around a long time before bourbon. So a little quick history 101 on whiskey. Mid-Atlantic, they were making whiskey. George Washington, Jefferson, making whiskey the Mid-Atlantic. Rye whiskey specifically. Uh, government decided to start taxing those whiskey distilleries. They didn't like that very much. So a lot of them moved out to Kentucky specifically. What was more prominent out there and a little bit less expensive to use was corn. And hence bourbon was founded and bourbon was born. Uh, um, you know, from those distillers moving out west. Uh, but we're here to really put Maryland back on the map for making rye whiskey. Um, and one of our key ingredients to our rye whiskey is our spring water. And we actually get that from a place called Sagmore Farm. It's a little farm. I say little, I joke, I kid. It's about 560 acres. It's in the Reisterstown, Glidden area. Um, and interesting enough, I used to drive by this farm uh, I grew up in Timonium, would drive out to Western Maryland, McDaniel College, and I would drive by this amazing thoroughbred horse farm. And at that time, when I was driving by it, it wasn't really, hadn't been built up, um, rebuilt again uh, from when Vanderbilt owned it. It was kind of in disarray, but I remember driving past the farm and then jumping on Route 140 and heading west uh, to McDaniel and to Western Maryland College for homecoming. You know, if I came home for the weekends, which is very rare because I like to stay on campus. And this is really the, the, the great inspiration behind this cocktail. Um, so I'm going to kick it off to Kevin, and he's going to go into how to build the cocktail and how to make it. Here you go, Kev. Absolutely. Thanks, Chad. You know, it's so funny because we, we didn't conspire beforehand to name this cocktail. 
Chad and I just accidentally had the exact same type of experience coming to coming into Westminster and coming to Western Maryland and, and going to the hill is driving uh, down 140. You know, I, I, I was doing it in college and, and you would see the water tower and some of the college buildings starting to pop out on, on, of the trees. And to me, that was homecoming. So when Heidi asked for a homecoming cocktail, West on 140 had to, had to be the name. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that it resonates with Chad as it resonates with me. And I hope many, of, many others of you too. But before we get to that, we're going to start off with something without alcohol in it because not all of us like a not all of us like a beverage with booze in it and uh, the, this is a great time to gather well not in these times to gather but uh, if we were to gather we would want everyone to have a drink in their hand of some kind and so what we're going to do is start off with a very simple cider punch that I've done um, this is going to be served in a Collins glass on ice we have some wonderful wonderful cider here. If you're not familiar and you don't remember, but Boggers Orchards uh, in Carroll County and Boggers uh, Cider Press, they make some of the best product out there. When I opened this jug the last night to taste some and uh, have a cocktail before I went to bed, I, I tasted it and just said, wow, this is so much better than I remember it being. And it, it really does stand the test of time. So. Uh, this cocktail is very simple. I don't know about you guys. I don't like to do a lot of dishes at home. So we're gonna build this cocktail right in the Collins glass that it's supposed to come in very simply. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna measure out, we're gonna measure out five ounces of apple cider to go into the glass. Kevin, that is a very fancy drink measure what if i don't have something like that at home you know you don't have to have the fanciest tools ever um these are nice japanese jiggers there's also the very common ones that you see everywhere that are kind of large and rectangular i do highly encourage you to jigger your drinks it's just like baking or cooking if you're not measuring what's going into your cocktail glass you're not gonna get the same result and if let's say you have a friend over or you're making a cocktail for your partner, you want, to, you want that cocktail to taste just as good as it did the first time around. So for me, a lot of it is just, hey, let's, let's uh, get a jigger. They're inexpensive. They're gonna run you less than five bucks and you can make great cocktails without having to worry about being inconsistent. Um, for restaurants, you know, the, the people that I work with, they absolutely have to jigger everything. You want the cocktail to taste the same for every guest. So. Um, okay. Yeah, so, and, um, so we have our cider in our Collins glass, and then I've made a little bit of a black tea spiced simple syrup, basically, and we're going to add that. I like to add the cider first, because the syrup itself is heavier in weight than the cider. So by doing that, and by, you kind of saw it, the, the syrup's already distributed throughout the glass already, throughout the cider, so it's almost pre-mixed. You don't have to worry about too much else. And then it's just ice cube time. Cubes are being finicky. Now, this is a great cocktail because it's extremely simple. That's basically it. Now, for me, we have obviously we eat with our eyes. It's something that we've always done. So let's dress it up a little bit. I'm gonna throw a lemon wedge on there. Lemon is a great complimentary fruit that goes really well with rye whiskey. Um, and in this case, it's just gonna brighten up the cider that we put in there um, since this is our mocktail. But if you wanna dress it up even further, take a couple apple slices and put them throughout the glass. They'll float a little bit. And that's just something for everyone and very light, bright, and non-alcoholic. Now, if you want to dress this up at home, you can throw a little club soda in there, give it a little effervescence if you want. Frankly, if you wanted to take it, turn it into a boozy drink, you add a little Sagamore rye to it, it tastes delicious. That's what I drank last night. So, um, But let's get going. We'll uh, start and talk about what's West on Route 140 is our cocktail for homecoming. Um, this is a very straightforward cocktail based around the idea of an old fashioned. Um, so we're going to do a couple techniques and 
none of these are very difficult. This is all stuff you can do at home. You might have to acquire a little bit of equipment. Um, we're going to use a mixing glass first and all, first and foremost. We're going to have a nice bar spoon. We're going to need a strainer. This is a julep strainer versus there's other types of strainers. One's called a Hawthorne strainer. Uh, that'll help us strain our cocktail out. And we're, of course, going to use our jiggers to measure out our cocktail. The first thing that we're going to do, though, um, before we even start with that, is we're going to put our ice cube into our glass. And ice, to me, is one of the most important ingredients in the cocktail. And in, the case, in these cases, we want to use a large format cube. That's what these are. These molds are really easy to find. You can get them anywhere these days. And um, once you find them on the internet, you can just have a couple ice molds in your fridge. I'm a regular whiskey drinker at home, so being able to pull out a big cube and plop it right into my, uh, my glass and pour some whiskey at night just makes it so much better. But we want to put this in the glass first because we want to temper the ice, which means we want it to come up to temperature so that when we pour the drink over it, it doesn't crack and we don't have the cocktail getting watered down so quickly. Uh, first things first uh, in our cocktail is Angostura bitters. This is probably the most recognizable cocktail bitter. It's in every supermarket everywhere. It's, you'll notice it by its oversized white label. Um, they're delicious. They're kind of the industry standard for bitters. So you can get these anywhere. When we build a drink, we always start with our smallest ingredient first and then build the cocktail from there. That way, if we do make a mistake, uh, over measuring, under measuring, we can correct it without ruining too much ingredient. So this is just one dash of Angostura bitters very simply in the bottom of the glass. And then we have a wonderful uh, dram or spirit from the West Indies called the St. Elizabeth's All Spice Dram. This is just a very heavily spiced uh, rum-based liqueur in, it, in its basic idea. Um, so this just tastes mostly like raw allspice. And this is gonna give us that beautiful kind of bright fall cocktail moment that we wanted um, with the, to go with the cider and the rye. Hey, um, Kevin, I have a question for you about the St. Elizabeth um, Dram. Sure. What if I can't find it in my local liquor store? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I know some of these things might seem a little weird or wonky. Um, first of all, check online. There's obviously great uh, availability these days. You can pretty much get anything online. I know for a fact, uh, my favorite liquor store in the world is uh, Astor Place Liquors in New York, and they've been shipping everywhere, and their system is great. It's one, a very easy website to negotiate, and you can find their selection is really unparalleled. So check them out, get something shipped to you directly. If not, if, all of, if you don't want to do any of that, the very simplest thing you can do is make an allspice simple syrup at home. So equal parts water and sugar, and then just put a whole bunch of whole allspice berries into the pot, let it sit and steep for a while. You'll get the same spice profile, but you're going to lose the alcohol moment um, that does provide this drink a little bit of structure, which is important. And that's when you throw more sagamore in, right, Chad? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you can <laughs> that by having just a little more rye, and it's not going to hurt anything. So, um, But before we get to the rye, we're going to go to vermouth. This is a dry vermouth from France. It's made by Dolan. Uh, again, available online pretty readily these days. Um, it gets imported through House Alpins. And it's, in my opinion, the best vermouth in the world. It's my house vermouth when I'm making a martini. Uh, it's my sweet, if I need a sweet vermouth, or sweet vermouth is my Manhattan sweet vermouth, without a doubt. And it, one of the reasons is it's so well produced and it falls back to the original um, idea that vermouth was built under, which is it's supposed to be a, a, an aromatic wine. And in this case, it's 80% wine is in that bottle. So you have to treat it right, keep it in your refrigerator after you open it. You want to move through it at a regular pace. That way it doesn't start to go bad. But frankly, this vermouth is, brings out all of the wonderful flavors. It's going to have wonderful herb components. So when we get to the cider, which has multiple different types of apples in it, this will start to play with the Granny Smiths in there and some of those harder apples. So um, you're not just getting the flat spiciness, you're getting a little bit of herbiness to it also. So we have that in our, in our cocktail glass. And then um, we're going to add one ounce of cider to our mixing glass. 
And that cider is so good. It's spectacular. <laughs> this top will make it through the day. After I'm done here, it's going to be apple cider. And then when the wife gets home and it's happy hour, it's going to be this cocktail. So <laughs> that will be fine. Um, and then last but not least, the Sagamore Rye. Um, you know, this is, for, for me, you know, we, we talked about, oh, we're going to do, we're going to do a cocktail with Sagamore. Well, we had to talk of, we had to go and get Bogger Cider because that way we have almost all of our spirits coming from Maryland, right? So <laughs> the key components of this drink literally come from the opposite ends of Route 140. Sagamore <laughs> Farm at one end, Westminster at the other. I don't know how you could go wrong. And I don't know in this day and age why you wouldn't want to purchase product that is so closely associated. <laughs> um, and, th and for this, we get an ounce and a half of our rye. And then we're just going to mix this up. It's fairly simple. Um, so Kevin, what if I didn't have rye at home? Could I use bourbon? Am I allowed to ask that, Chad? You, no. You know, Chad, no. Chad already really <laughs> explained to us that, you know, bourbon and rye are dramatically different. Um, rye is obviously made from the, the rye grain, whereas bourbon is made from corn. Um, so the flavors taste differently. You could absolutely, if you just got a bottle of bourbon laying around and you wanted to sub it in, go right ahead. But I'll tell you this, you're going to lose different flavor profiles. With the Sagamore, when I was building this cocktail, just take, you know, just sipping on the Sagamore a little bit, you really started to get this wonderful cracked pepper note. It's got a little bit of a spiciness to it, both on the nose and in the palate. So that is going to work so well with our cider component, giving it a little bit of spice, playing around with the allspice that we put in there, the bitters. Um, you know, it's a unique thing. You use rye, or I'm sorry, if you use bourbon, you're going to end up with a little more caramel apple type of notes to it because bourbon just has a different profile and you might lose some of the spice. You could definitely do it. It's just not the same spirit. <laughs> um, so great. So we've added our ice to our shaker. We've got our cocktail glass ready. And now all we've got to do is stir to combine. Now, a lot of people might want to shake this cocktail. And frankly, when you have juice in a cocktail, you should shake it. But in this case, what we want is that smooth mouthfeel that comes with stirring a drink. And this is the best way to get it. Stirring is, it doesn't take really any longer than it would take you if I were to be shaking this cocktail. Um, but what I'm looking for is the mixing glass to start to frost over a little bit and the cocktail to increase in volume in the glass. I'll also touch it. Once the glass starts to get cold, then I'm knowing I'm getting close to the cocktail being ready. And I've got a beautiful frost on this now, and the cocktail is ready to go. Back to my julep strainer. And then we're just going to pour this over that large format cube that we had. That looks great, Kevin, but we don't want to sip yet. I do want to ask you, Our pull way. that stir back out, please. <laughs> it's very large. I don't have a stir like that at home. So why, why is it so fancy and, and what can I use at home? Sure. I mean, frankly, you can use a teaspoon <laughs> to do that same trick if you wanted to. If you got a long handled soup spoon, anything like that, go right ahead. It does. The, the idea is that you don't want to introduce air into the drink because that creates a different type of mouthfeel. What we want is a smooth, rich, spiritous type of feeling in your mouth. So by stirring, that's, what, that's how we get that. And in this case, um, with the juice, with the rye, with the allspice, everything now, we combined it together. If you didn't, if you didn't have this to stir it, you could, you know, like, uh, there's a very famous cocktailian named um, Gaz Regan, Gary Regan, and he, he's, his thing when he stirs his Negronis is he does it with his finger. So you, if you can do that for Negroni, you can do it for this too. So <laughs> no big deal. Um, you know, this is a great cocktail. It's ready to go. But hey, you know, again, I think uh, a little bit of decor looks great on our drinks. Um, for this, if you, make a, um, if you make a rye cocktail, you really should garnish it with a little bit of lemon. Lemon and rye are very, uh, very complementary flavors to each other. Um, so in this case, I just like to give it a little bit of a lemon twist just over the glass and around the rim. And then that's kind of junky, so I don't put it in my drink. But I will go back to my nice slices of apple that I had. And you can take a couple of these. You can lay them on top, float them in the drink. 
however you'd like. Um, for me, I'm just going to float them on my cube there. And we're all set. It's a very easy cocktail. I think you can make it at home. There's ways to fudge it. And uh, frankly, you, whenever you make a drink, there's really no wrong way as long as it tastes good to you. So enjoy. <laughs> That's great. And it's super fancy for somebody who doesn't like to do dishes. Um. <laughs> Absolutely. You got to keep this simple. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I mentioned earlier um, when we started that uh, Sagamore Spirit had to pivot a little bit during um, COVID. So, Chad, could you talk a little bit about how this pandemic has impacted the food and beverage industry? Yeah, like I mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of your distilleries switch over making hand sanitizer for healthcare facilities, you know, frontline workers and things like that. Um, restaurants and bars, to be frank, have been devastated. Um, a lot of these restaurants and bars are not going to be able to recover uh, after the pandemic. Uh, interesting enough, off-premise uh, retail stores have been very, very busy. A lot of people are staying home. Uh, hopefully people are drinking more in moderation. Um, you know, they've been pretty busy, but it's, you know, real important right now, especially as things slowly start to reopen, <laughs> is go out and support your local restaurants and bars. Get carry out tip 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 heavy um you know because a lot of these servers and kevin can talk about it you know that's what they depend on they depend on your tips so please get out there and frequent uh your local establishments and support them yeah i i there's not too much more to say to that other than you know as as somebody who works in a restaurant you know a bartender or server now not only do they have the hardest job which is caring for all these guests and, and all of their individual needs and, and making sure everything goes perfectly. But now they have to do it with all of the COVID restrictions hanging over their head. And with the new daunting idea is that they are then healthcare supervisors in their properties. Uh, and so please, you know, treat everyone with respect and tip, 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 tip. It's uh, the, I, the industry is completely gutted at this point and all of the efforts that you're seeing by your local establishments, whether they're setting up outdoor cafes or doing unique to go, this is just them trying to keep the lights on. So please help them out. You know, if you have a pizza shop down the street, don't order Domino's, order from those guys. It, you know, if you have the local, you know, you go to Boggers and you get some local, uh, you know, breakfast, that's a hundred times better than going to Denny's. Uh, it's, the the big guys are going to be there when this is over but the little guys are really struggling living you know hand to fist right now so. and, and, and one add on that too is is try to order directly from the restaurants and bars the apps are super easy but a lot of them take a service charge so they're they're actually cutting the profits uh that that restaurant and bar would make i guarantee most of these if you call them and you say hey do you deliver here and if they can they'll take your order and then it's going right to that restaurant or bar yeah, absolutely. Anything you can do to funnel more money back into that industry, which hasn't received a bailout, hasn't received anything uh, to support it, please help help out where you can. <laughs> it's um, it's that time that it's the least we can do. And I know from you know because I work with those uh, businesses, and because the minute that COVID became a reality in America, all of those businesses, my services were no longer needed things got very tough for them very quickly, um, pretty much overnight. So anything that they're doing and they're doing well is a testament to them being great at what they're doing. So a lot of respect <laughs> for anybody out there. And that's, that's great advice, not only to, you know, source um, the food that you eat local, but support the local people who are also sourcing local and um, great advice to, you know, actually do the old fashioned thing and, and pick up a phone and call um, the restaurants directly to order your, your takeout. Um, one of the things that I have seen shift here is, you know, before COVID, you couldn't walk out of a restaurant with a drink in your hand, right? And now you can get mason jars of, um, you know, in Maryland, it's orange, crush, orange crushes or whatever to, to go, right? And um, it's just been interesting to see how that the industry has pivoted a little bit to do anything that they can to keep the lights on. Yeah, and, and that goes for people like Sagamore and your local brewery, your local distillery. You know, if you're driving to the restaurant to pick up your pizza, man, swing by the local brewery and buy a six pack from them. Or, mm -hmm. or, or swing by, you know, uh, place an order for 
curbside pickup of some bottles of Sagamore uh, or whoever's local to you. There are so many new, I mean, in Westminster, there's the old Westminster winery that's doing great product these days. And they, they need your help as much as they can because they lost all of their restaurant contracts. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, you can, if you can be as local and as, uh, you know, uh, local centric as you can be now, now's the time to do it. Just do it, do it safely and support the people. <laughs> it's, so it looks like a Green Terra Nation should be uh, eating and drinking well, right? That's what we should be doing during these times. So I know before we come together and actually have a toast with these um, freshly made drinks, Chad actually has some Sagamore swag that we will be raffling off. And we will be, for any of, the, of you who are on tonight and had pre-registered, um, we hope that you're enjoying your uh, etched McDaniel glasses as well as the big ice cube mold that we had mailed to you as well. And we will be announcing the winners of the Sagamore swag um, on our alumni Facebook page. So make sure you check us out there. So thanks so much to both of you. And Kevin, how about a toast? Absolutely. So to all of us Green Terrors for Life, to the Terror Nation at large, let's uh, go west on Route 140 sometime soon and get back to the hill when we can. All the best. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>